My name is Jeff Gray, and I've been a reporter at the Globe and Mail for 25 years. I don't know, is that sympathy or, I don't know. Feels weird to say that out loud, actually. Uh, I now cover Queen's Park, Ontario's legislature, but for too many years to have been healthy, uh, I spent my days at the building I uh, continue to call the clamshell, Toronto's City Hall. And I feel a little out of a place tonight as a mere reporter, I have to say. The panel, the people you're going to hear from, and the ideas and uh, the, the, I mean, the, the caliber of the resumes here, uh, you know, my, my introduction is the shortest reporter. That's, that's what I do. Uh, but I think what I can offer is a, a, some insight anyway, um, based on years spent peering into the sausage maker that is local democracy in this province and in this city. Uh, it's a sausage maker that I think everybody would agree is a bit uh, worse for wear. Uh, just like the other sausage makers, the federal and provincial sausage makers are also, uh, I think, a bit worn these days, and, but they're all worth fixing. Let's talk about cities. Uh, they're being asked to do so much of the heavy lifting in our society now. They're on the front lines of the housing crisis, the opioid crisis, uh, climate change, but cities have actually on paper in this country very little power and there's a pretty broad consensus that they don't have the money required to do all of these things we expect them to do now. And so these are the challenges, these are the things we've been covering that I've been covering since uh, I was a young pup. Um, our constitution, conveniently, doesn't mention municipalities and leaves their fate completely in the hands of the province. As we learned in Ontario in 2018, when Premier Doug Ford uh, slashed the number of city councillors in this city almost in half in the middle of an election. Uh, he's made a bunch of uh, interventions in municipal affairs since, and in fact, it's just been a blizzard of changes to the way municipalities operate, the way they can charge developers, development charges, uh, uh, and, and, all, and, and all sorts of other things. Uh, those of us paid to follow this, actually, uh, we're, we're having trouble. We're having trouble keeping up. Um, so slow down, please, you know. Uh, of course, it was mentioned in the, off the top, the strong mayor uh, powers, that's another example of the type of change he's made. This is different than the way we used to make changes to municipal governments, uh, governance in, in, in the 20th century. Uh, when Metro was created, it actually took 20 years for that process uh, when Metro was created in the 1950s. I don't remember that, I think. Uh, there might be some people who remember Metro out in the crowd. There's somebody, somebody waving back there. Um, so uh, this obviously has provoked a reaction from a lot of people in municipal circles. What, how could we insulate cities from this kind of interference? Um, it's worth mentioning, though, that the justification for all this interference is the housing crisis. That's the problem governments everywhere are trying to fix. So there's talk about charter cities. No one's been able to explain to me what a charter city is or how it would work or how that would stop Doug Ford from doing something to the city of Toronto, so we can leave that aside. Other people talk about constitutional changes. Good luck with that. Um, and I think this has an effect, though. I mean, Shaw McAuliffe in The Star argued recently that if you have a provincial government that is constantly changing the, the rules for municipal governments, we're going to have even more trouble convincing people to vote in municipal elections because what's the point? Someone else has got the power. Uh, but there are some interesting things that maybe are happening as a reaction. There are a number of new local citizens movements across the province, um, anti-sprawl movements, uh, uh, very successful, although it was of course crushed uh, eventually, but um, activists really pushed back against an edict to expand Hamilton's boundaries into farmland. Uh, so there are things like that that are happening, and maybe that will that portends a, a change in the way municipal politics are, are done. All right, so we fixed democracy. Uh, the next thing we need to talk about is the money. Um, cities uh, simply, well, even at the moment, uh, Toronto is grappling with these huge budget uh, holes caused by COVID. Leave that aside. Even in normal times, cities in this country are way too dependent on property taxes. That has been long been the consensus. They need other forms of revenue. But when you start to ask them, well, what other forms of revenue? How uh, would you, what would you do? Everybody starts to sort of step away from the, step away from the podium. Um, when I covered David Miller, when he was mayor, 
here, uh, there was a push to get a piece of the GST for cities, which seems like a easy way to get someone else to collect the tax and you get to spend it, that's a good, that's a good deal. Uh, what David Miller ended up getting was changes to the City of Toronto Act that resulted in a whole bunch of new taxing powers that no one in the city really wanted to use. Like, get, imagine getting reelected on a, on a platform of, I brought in the booze tax. Uh, we did end up with land transfer tax on home purchases, which has saved the city budget for decades, or a decade and a half, I guess. Um, one radical idea that keeps coming up is the idea of cities should have uh, their own income tax. Radical, who would think of such a thing? Uh, I recently learned that until 1935, Ontario municipalities had the right to raise their own income taxes, but they never did it because it was, people didn't like it. Uh, you know, and there's a whole complicated story about the Depression, about why they were stripped of that power. One possible move we might see is tolls. Take a deep breath, it's okay. <laughs> uh, road to, John Tory tried to do road tolls. Kathleen Wynne said yes, then she said no in 2016. Um, they were commonplace in 19th century Ontario. I think under this government, they're a complete non-starter at Queen's Park, but eventually, I think that's going to be a source of revenue that cities, not just Toronto, others start to look at, um, plus it has other benefits as well. Uh, here's, here's an example of a city that actually successfully overcame that kind of political third rail around road tolls. Stockholm, 2006, wanted to do a London-style congestion charge. Uh, a cordon around the center of the city and charge cars coming in and out. People hated that idea, but Stockholm said, okay, okay, a pilot project for six months, and then we'll have a binding referendum. If you don't like it, we'll take it out. And Stockholm residents voted in favor of that congestion charge after having it for six months because it, it made traffic flow better and they saw the revenue coming in that the city could use for other things. So. Local democracy at work. The sausage maker worked. So cities to succeed, I think, need to become better democracies. And they need money. And we might just fix that sausage maker. Thank you.